What can the Fed do when there are no good choices? Hi, everyone. Welcome to this extended version of the Real Vision Daily Briefing. We're coming to you early and for an hour so we can break down the Fed meeting and the presser that is just wrapping up. And joining me, a couple of familiar faces. We have Mike Kuba, who is founder and CIO of Strong Capital Management, and Andreas Steno Larson, who is the founder of Steno Research. And a little bit later, at the top of the hour, we're going to be joined by Darius Dell of 42 Macro. Hi, fellas. Great to see you. Hi, Maggie. Hey, Maggie. How's it going? It's going well. I'm just listening to Jay Powell. I think we all were. So uh, as expected, 25 basis points, a um, little bit of change in the language of the statement. What what did you make of it? I mean, it was expected, but did he say anything that stood out to you? Uh, Mike, let's start with you. Uh, you know, so I was telling Andreas before we jumped on live here that to me, I thought the biggest thing was just this felt like a very sloppy press conference for Powell. Um, you know, usually, even though he makes some contradictory statements, it just seemed like he realized that they were kind of in a really no no win situation. Um, and he just made some real head scratcher type statements to me that, you know, I mean, we can get into in a little bit, but I just, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It was, it was not one of his best performances in my opinion. Yeah, maybe maybe because of what we started out with, the options are tough. Um, Andreas, what did you think? I mean, I, I I thought it was, I thought his comments around banking were, you know, it's kind of kind of tough. I mean, obviously he doesn't want to panic people, but it didn't sound like he was willing to say too much. What what stood out to you? Well, I found it interesting that he basically started off the presser with a comment on the situation in banking. And he told us that uh, the conditions had brought the improved since the last meeting in March, which I firmly disagree with. Um, and I also expect the market to disagree with that view when we see the ultimate reaction to this press conference, uh, maybe tomorrow or later this week. Uh, because, I mean, I think three banks are out since the last uh, press conference in March. Uh, so obviously conditions haven't improved. And um, it's kind of a hawkish signal to me that they're not willing to more explicitly um, accept that banking is vulnerable here. Yeah. I, I, is, is, do you feel that way, Mike? I mean, that's a great point, Andreas. You know, if, if we don't admit it's happening and, and they did once again really stress the fight against inflation. I mean, they have been saying that it's an echo of what we heard before, but they're continuing on that on that path with the rhetoric, at least. Yeah, you know, I I completely agree with Andreas that, you know, to me, the statement certainly seemed to be more hawkish, um, especially his comments, because, you know, he talked about labor demand still being significantly outstripping supply, talked about inflation still being far too high. And, you know, I, I just found some of his comments, you know, about, you know, it almost seemed like he was kind of aloof to the situation with the banking. I mean, obviously he's not, he's aware of what's going on. But it just kind of seemed like a real lack of concern. And I get he doesn't want to kind of scare the the public with with being overly uh, sensitive. But, you know, talking about how monetary policy and, and stability tools, you know, are working together and they're not working in contradiction, which I thought was a bit baffling, um, you know, considering that a lot of this has come about due to rising rates. Um, you know, and then he made some statements that, you know, they do think that inflation will take a long while to come back down, um, you know, and they're debating on kind of what that sufficiently restrictive level is. And then in the very next breath, he said that he actually thinks that we could be at that sufficiently restrictive stand. So it, it, like I said, I mean, it just seemed like he was kind of all over the place. I mean, he even had sort of a little foot in the mouth where they were talking about wage pressures and how that could you know, fuel inflation. And he he felt the need to kind of go back and clarify something that was unsaid. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to me, it was a little concerning sort of the lackadaisical attitude he had towards the banking situation. Yeah. I mean, he's in a possible situation, though. But I just want to mention, you know, ADP payrolls came out today, right? Stronger than expected. We're going to get that job uh, number, the monthly government number tomorrow. The data is not working in his favor. It didn't do him. It didn't help very much at all. But Andreas, when you're talking about uh, the banking situation, uh, hard to think of what he could say, especially now that, and I think he touched on this for a moment, now that we saw the speed with which things move, when you're talking about people jumping on their phone, I mean, if he said anything indicating they were concerned, doesn't that 
doesn't that always mean, well, if they're a little bit concerned, then we should be freaking out because there's no way they're going to touch. I mean, how could he possibly say anything that was going to be well received, whether it's concern or not? I mean, it, it, it was a no win, wasn't it? Uh, it, it's, it is impossible for him to say something clever about the banking situation. So he basically accepted the fact that he couldn't say much. Um, but just yesterday, uh, one of the members of the uh, Economic Council advising the White House on um, economic matters explicitly said that raising interest rates at this juncture would probably cause more stress in the banking system. Uh, I think uh, she's right, that member of the uh, Economic Council. And Ultimately, I guess Jay Powell could have said that, given that the White House, White House basically accepted that notion yesterday explicitly. So that could have been an option. Uh, it would have been a very dovish option. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in case he wanted to say something explicit, he could have mirrored that statement. Yeah. Uh, did you find it interesting that there were no dissents, guys? Because, I mean, if, if everyone is saying this, and, and some of them had gone on the record also expressing concern about this, but no one dissented. What do you think that's about? Well, I, if, if you look at it, I think the consensus was, was made uh, between Doves and Hawks by accepting a hike today, but also more or less explicitly accepting a pause com communicated in the statement. Mm -hmm. uh, the Doves wanted that pause in the statement, so they have no explicit tightening bias left meaning that um, it is basically the central banker's way of communicating that the base case is now that we shouldn't expect any more um, interest rate hikes from here. The base case is a pause. That is essentially what they write in the statement. So I think that was the compromise made between Hawks and Doves. Yeah. And Mike, I think he, I think he's trying to kick it over to the supervisors, right? He was talking about Barr and not wanting to interfere and that it's in his hands. But as you pointed out, completely sidestepping the issue of the Fed, you know, what impact Fed policy is having. Yeah, you know, and so I thought Steve Leisman from CNBC there had a great question, sort of kind of putting the onus on Powell, you know, looking at sort of the review that had come out, I think they talked about back in February, and Powell said he was aware of it, he remembers it, um, and said that there was really nothing of concern, you know, and, and Steve Leisman kind of put him on the spot and said, well, you know, to, not to be too argumentative, but, you know, it did raise the issues at SVB. And so, you know, I think for me, that was just sort of, I get that he doesn't want to really scare the public, but it was just, you know, the, I thought that exchange was really kind of, you know, uh, to me, that was like hard, part of that, like concerning that, you know, are they truly listening? Do they really fully grasp what's going on with the banking sector and the potential ramifications, or did they just kind of view it as a one-off? I mean, Powell made the statement, um, you know, that with First Republic, that was kind of the line in the sand, you know, that that line was drawn under that episode. And I mean, two days later after First Republic, you sort of fell apart there and JP Morgan bought them. I mean, we saw what happened with PAC West Bank Corp and Western mm -hmm. Alliance. And so, I mean, do they have their heads in the sand? I mean, I don't. It doesn't seem like they're they're fully in tune to what's going on. I think you just said something really, really important, Mike. That they don't want to scare the public. I don't think Jay Powell was talking to the markets today. I think he was talking to the American people, um, and the markets were looking for a lot more clarification, a lot, uh, you know, an, an understanding that the Fed had control over this. I, I'm not sure that was his constituency today, which may explain what was going on. Uh, Andreas, how worried are you about the banking system? Well, I expect another couple of regional banks to fold within, say, seven to 10 days from here. I think that's a very, very likely scenario. Um, the issue is that the deal that was struck between the FDIC and JP Morgan did uh, no good in terms of comforting markets on the value of the collateral underlying um, the loan book of First Republic Bank. Remember that um, the FDIC ultimately offered J.P. Morgan an 80-20 split in the loss share agreement, meaning that the FDIC will take 80% of the hit if something happens to the loan book. Uh, to me, it is as strong a signal as you can get that the collateral underlying that loan book, commercial real estate in California, also to a certain extent residential real estate in California, is deeply underwater relative to what we know as of now. Um, so every single bank with a loan book with a large exposure to Californian real estate, real estate should be scared of the market right now. You know, uh, 
Chris Whalen was on Twitter, I think it was earlier today, uh, saying regional banks are basically meme stocks and that shorts are going to make their way down the list. That's a kind of a frightening statement. Uh, Chris knows his way in and out of the banking system, though. So when he says something like that, it gives me pause and, and cause for concern. Mike, are, are the shorts just lining up now? Is this inevitable that they're just going to try to keep picking off these banks until somehow there is some authority, something changes? Yeah, I mean, that certainly seems to be the way the market's operating is they're, they're sort of picking up on the similarities between, you know, common equity to assets and, and the different relationships that the banks have and just sort of going down the line, you know, after SVB, you know, and then it kind of made its way to First Republic and after First Republic, they kind of looked at the next, you know, names that were similar and, you know, kind of gutting for that. And so, I mean, I, look, I don't know if it's, necessarily short sellers per se. I, I I never like to blame short sellers on the collapse of something, um, you know, because certainly there's, I mean, look, we saw with the initial mini crisis, if that's what you want to call it, there was a, an article that was out that talked about how there was one of the largest inflows into call option activity on the regional banking ETFs and various regional banks. And so, you know, you have to remember that still, I mean, people are still so conditioned that the Fed's not going to let anything happen. I mean, and we saw this all throughout 2022 and people are still operating under that same sort of framework where, you know, fine, I'm just going to buy something that gets bombed out because it's going to snap back. The Fed's going to step in, the Fed's going to save it. And I mean, so yes, absolutely. I'm sure there's short sellers targeting it. Um, you know, but there's probably plenty of long money that's, that's trapped and trying to buy the dips on, on these as well. But yeah, Mag, no, that's Mag, a good point. Yeah. Maggie, let me add a, a piece of anecdotal evidence from my neck of the woods. Um, the biggest private pension fund in Sweden, Elekta, laid off their CEO just a few weeks ago because of positions in Signature Bank and Silicon mm. Valley Bank. Uh, it is one of the biggest private pension funds in Europe at all. And I can guarantee you if um, I was the CEO of another pension fund after that happening, I would call portfolio managers straight away to tell them to get rid of any position at all in any single names in US regional stocks. So I guess the spillovers uh, from the Silicon Valley Bank case uh, are also very, very clear in long only managers across the globe. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great anecdote, uh, Andres, because I think it shows like this is global. It's very hard to ring fence these things when they start happening. Um, and, and I have an, an important point on that. Some great comments coming in. There seems to be a lot of concern. George is saying the FOMC Fed has raised rates. Now we're waiting and watching to see what will break. Strap in. Uh, someone else talking, I think it was Jared uh, Dillian, uh, saying this is going to be a terrible month. It does seem that people are getting more concerned. But is that, are people talking about that or is that reflected in the market at all? Mike and Andreas, do you see any gauge of that? It's been hard to watch the VIX because people are thinking maybe that's not picking up stuff um, as much as maybe it would be. Are you looking at anything or do you see any concerns or strains in the market? Mike? So, I mean, the one thing that I wrote to clients, um, I think it was just the end of last week, was, you know, is calm as high yield credit spreads have been. We do see a, a very interesting divergence building there between say that and the VIX, you know, some other sort of type of fear gauge. And so, you know, with the, with the VIX, I mean, certainly there's, there's a lot that goes into that. I mean, there is an argument to be made, uh, you know, if you look at an implied to realized ratio, implied was still extremely elevated to say the realized levels that we've been seeing. And so there's some, you know, sort of, I guess, selling off in the implied so kind of come back more in line where you really start to get concern um, is when you see sort of a discount in terms of implied to realize. So realize is starting to pick up realized volatility while implied is kind of still asleep at the wheel. Um, and that's not where we were, right? We were at these sort of persistently higher VIX readings that we had seen over you know the past several years. Um, and so that's sort of just sort of re reverting back. But if you look at sort of, I would say the last two weeks, high yield spreads aren't coming back down, right? They're not doing what the VIX is doing. High yield spreads are still way off sort of their October lows, whereas like the VIX is piercing through the October lows from the, um, so I mean, or I'm sorry, the January lows. And so 
if you look at something like that, I would definitely say that's that's worth a concern. Um, you know, and, and coming back to today, I mean, I think the biggest looming risk out there is the dollar. Um, you know, I personally am, you know, starting to position the portfolio a little bit more along the dollar. Um, you know, I look at sort of, you know, a situation, say, over in Europe. Um, you know, if there's a situation, like I'm not a banking expert, but I look at something like an inverted yield curve is the same in Europe as it is here in the U.S. You look at sort of, if you look at the damage that's been done to banks here in the U.S. from rising rates, I mean, Europe is in a very similar situation, right? They were at negative rates. Um, and so, you know, I look at all the influx and kind of consensus that Europe is going to be this major winner from China reopening. You see speculator positioning in the euro at near record highs. And I just become very concerned because I think everyone is just so much that the Fed is done. The Fed is going to pivot towards rate cuts and they just think the dollar is dead. Um, and for me, I think that could sort of be a major risk that people are on if we get sort of a credit liquidity sort of major risk off event, the dollar picks up steam as these things are unwound. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I certainly see several like breadcrumbs laying around out there that that could could lead to something. Mm. Andreas, what are you what are you paying attention to? What are you watching? Thanks to what Mike said before, I'll um, talk about uh, what I find to be a very clear signal from equity markets that we're actually starting to price in a recession now. Uh, but one thing that strikes me is that if you ask global investors for their uh, positions in equity space um, on a geographical uh, layer, then uh, the most clear overweight right now is France, while the US is at the rock bottom as an underweight for most uh, global portfolio managers. And I can guarantee you, even though France is a lovely country to visit, that it will not be the epicenter of an uh, <laughs> extreme growth rebound. I, I, mean, I mean, it's not going to happen. Uh, so I, ex I consider this consensus story uh, to be too extreme now that Europe will outperform right about everything in this cycle. Uh, I, I don't believe that it will be the case in six months from now. So I tend to agree with, with Mike's assessments. Um, when it comes to the equity market right now, uh, I see the early signs of a very classic recessionary sector rotation, uh, meaning that we see consumer staples, utilities outperforming uh, high duration stocks such as consumer discretionary um, technology stocks, et cetera, over the most recent uh, trading period. Uh, and that is really interesting because that's typically what you see into a recession. Um, when the recession hits, when the consumer is hit, you should expect equities with products in the very uh, lower tiers of Maslow's hierarchy to perform relative to, for example, luxury goods and stuff like that. And that is happening now. Uh, I think that is about as firm a signal as you can get from equity markets that uh, the recession is slowly but surely being priced in. Hmm. Uh, I want to play a clip for both of you when we're talking about uh, the worries and the concerns and the risks that might not be priced in. Uh, Jeff Snyder was on yesterday um, and he was talking about commercial real estate. We get a lot of questions about it. It comes up a lot. You were just mentioning it um, when we were talking about California. And his concern is that the, the situation of commercial real estate may snake its way into the system in a more systemic way um, through derivative products. It's it's a little bit of a long clip. People heard it yesterday if you tuned in, but I want to play it again because I think it's really, really important and not a lot of people are talking about it. And I want to get your thoughts on it. So let's hear what he had to say. Well, because securitized structures, we, structure, we started structuring uh, illiquid loans so that they could be packaged as liquid collateral to be used in collateralized transactions, whether repo or derivatives, whatever the case may be. And it was a good idea way back in the 70s and 80s when it really started. It took off in the, in the late 80s. But there's a downside to that, too, because you could be packaging loans that on the surface seem like they're, they're worth putting together in a pool. You can slice and dice them up as, as you need to. You can create the specific economic or financial parameters for each, each, uh, each structure as they roll off an assembly line. But as we saw in 2008, and again, I hesitate to make the comparison, subprime mortgage structures, mortgage bonds and things like that, CDOs that were packaged together with yep. certain illiquid loans that we didn't really understand how they behaved under stress conditions. What you end up with is a bunch of 
ostensibly illiquid, unknowable products put together in a pool that are then, it's at one point, they're valued in a way that they probably should never be valued. And then the liquidity characteristics of those products, of the CLOs or whatever the case may be, whatever securitized structure it is, they tend to behave very differently than how they're modeled when they're put together because they're mm -hmm. modeled under a certain set of tolerances and history has shown that it's quite easy to violate those tolerances. So in, in the case where anybody has been using CLOs as collateral either directly in, in uh, funding transactions or as a three-legged transaction with um, you know transforming, le uh, putting up CLO collateral in exchange for say a US treasury and then using the US treasury uh, securities transformation, it, it, it allows these risky assets to essentially impact and affect the collateral, the, the systemic uh, yep. position of collateral all across the entire monetary system. Right, so they it, snake it, into the system. I, I really wanted to play that again because I think it's such an important point. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what both of you think about it. And I think Jeff took great pains to say, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just concerned. I'm concerned that we could see, and it's so opaque, it's so hard to know what's happening in those markets. You know, how can we assess that? And if it's even remote, are people focused on it enough? And are the authorities focused on it enough? Um, Mike, I know you I know you, you have a lot of experience in insurance uh, as well. What do you think? I mean, is that should this be something that we're, we, we should be concerned about? And we should be talking about more? Yeah, I mean, I think this goes back to something that Maggie, you and I have talked about on a number of occasions, and that's sort of how a lot of the risk was offloaded from bank balance sheets following 2008 and where that sits now. And so that's where I think a lot of these issues could pop could pop up. As Jeff said, I mean, we don't know if it's going to happen and you know, we don't think that's baseline necessarily, but that's where you could start to see these things and sort of the, um, you know, private market, whether it's private equity, whether it's real estate direct um, types of products with like a BlackRock or Blackstone or whatever it might be. And so I think that's where the issues could pop up because following 2008, banks offloaded it. Well, investors somewhere need to hold that, right? I mean, the projects are still getting financed. These um, different products are still being packaged up and sold off. And so that's sitting somewhere. And so I would argue that you know, that could be even scarier if it were to actually unfold because, you know, as opaque as things were with 2008 and what the banks were holding and what they were doing. I mean, now that's, like I said, it's across private asset managers where arguably regulators have even less insight into what's going on and what's on their balance sheets. Yeah. I, I, Andreas, maybe, uh, maybe a stupid question, but does it make it less risky if it's in across the private market because it's not a big regulated bank or it, is it is it still we're talking about pension funds and and there's tons of exposure there and do you think that this issue of commercial real estate and i think the focus is there because of what's gone on what's happening with interest rates and also the change right the change in office buildings these big mm. um shifts in work that draw out the timeline of what a cycle might look like, a down cycle might look like. How are you thinking about all this? I mean, if if we look at the price development of office space, for example, in San Francisco, the um, most recent price dynamic is outright um, disastrous. So obviously this will show up um, in the value of collateral underlying both on and off balance sheet uh, debt both in the banking sector, but also in um, in the insurance sector and in the pension fund sector, et cetera. Uh, I actually consider it an issue that um, the Federal Reserve does not have a direct line to those in trouble in case that we should see spillovers to insurance companies and pension funds. It makes it a whole lot more difficult to throw money at the problem. Um, and the only solution should push come to shove is basically to just add a lot of liquidity to the market and hope for the best, uh, exactly as Bank of England did once the um, the pension fund sector um, started struggling back in November last year. So uh, ultimately, we know what happens should the insurance sector and the pension fund sector get into trouble as a consequence of this. QE will arrive again. Yeah, QE. And speaking of, uh, there are an awful lot of rate cuts priced into the market. 
And Jay Powell didn't give any indication they were leaning that way. I think people think he's BSing, but Mike, is the market mispricing or misjudging the Fed? So what I thought was interesting is as soon as Powell started to speak, right? I mean, you basically saw the initial dovish reaction to the announcement get unwound. So, you know, initially the dollar sold off, bonds were holding firm, gold sort of went on a run. And as Powell spoke, basically all that reversed. Oil, gasoline, none of those things really budged. They actually resumed their sell-offs on the day. Copper didn't really budge. Gold sort of gave up some of its gains. And then the front end of the of the curve, I mean, started to sell off. And then after Powell stopped talking, the press conference ended, it's like we immediately started pricing all that back in. So, you know, you look at like Sofer Futures in, in December of this year, and they were almost back flat on the day. And then after Powell stopped speaking, it finished up around 14 basis points. So, I mean, it had a pretty sizable rally in the last, you know, say half hour of, of the day. And so, you know, yeah, I mean, Powell made a few statements in his comments where he, you know, I thought the statement where they basically said, you know, determine if more tight tightening is necessary, and they didn't say anything about whether rate cuts would be necessary. And he even said, you know, if their forecasts are correct, then rate cuts are not appropriate. So he certainly, you know, as much as people want to read that into dovish, I thought that was more of the hawkish aspect. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like the market just kind of, once he got done talking, just went right back on their way uh, to starting to try to price in some rate cuts because you saw a slight steepening in the curve at the end of the day as well. Yeah, they're just convinced that he's not, either doesn't know or isn't saying. Um, uh, Andreas, on this point, John asking, uh, can you ask the guys to comment on the fact that he, Jay Powell, sees moderate growth or small recession, very contrary to the market? Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, the market consensus is a recession commencing in the third quarter. Uh, and ultimately, that recession needs to arrive rather sooner than later to confirm the market pricing of rate cuts. Otherwise, we obviously won't get those rate cuts. To me, it's a matter of um, when, not if, we will see the first rate cut um, now. Uh, I, I ran the... Um, press release through a uh, word matching model and uh, compared it to the January 2019 um, statement from the Federal Reserve. And it it felt very similar when I read the two and uh, when I um, ran the word matching um, machinery, it also confirmed my vibes. Uh, January 2019 was the first meeting um, with the pause after the hiking cycle, cycle, hiking cycle um, concluding in in December 2018 due to the mayhem in, in equity markets, and the statement is very very similar. Uh, in 2019, it took roughly six months before the cutting cycle commenced. Uh, something similar to that would actually lead to a very hawkish repricing of the current outlook. Um, so, it's a matter of when, not if, and I'm not sure that the market will get the rate cuts as early as they expect them to. Yeah, yeah, that seems what it says. We've got Darius in the house. Hey, Darius. Great hey, Maggie, how's it going? We're, we're just talking about the fact that Jay Powell sort of sticking to his hawkish tone and at odds with the market, whether you're looking at um, him talking about moderate growth, very small recession, no need for easing, and then kind of skirt, completely skirting around the bank issue, just saying the banking system sound and solid and not really giving it much more steam. What'd you make of the whole uh, presser and statement? Uh, so a couple of uh, key takeaways and, and welcome guys. How's it going? Andreas, Michael, it's good to be back with you guys. Uh, so I'd say three key things um, just to answer your question specifically. I don't know that he said anything that changes you know, market pricing or the market outlook in a material way. I think the pause was pretty much well telegraphed. Uh, the continuation of balance sheet runoff was pretty well telegraphed. And, and let's be honest here, you know, this is a Jay Powell-led FOMC that has been getting walked around like a dog by the data for, you know, the better part of two years now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't know that he's going to say anything for looking that's going to be especially uh, revealing to asset markets um, on a day like today. So uh, that's kind of our general takeaway. Uh, and then kind of secondary, secondarily, you know, it's kind of what wasn't said and what wasn't really focused on, because I think the whole kind of discussion around the policy rate kind of misses the broader point in terms of the go forward outlook for Fed policy, which is something we wrote about in our late morning note this morning, which is the balance sheet's going to be back in focus. And that because of QT just remaining ongoing, you know, these folks would like you to believe that it's 
like watching paint dry or like watching grass grow. And for the most part, it has been, you know, going back to kind of um, late 2024, you know, this is a Federal Reserve that, you know, that's basically been doing toothless QT. Um, and the reason I say that is because on a net basis, the U.S. Treasury hasn't really issued any debt, you know, since going back to November, December of last year, because they've been kind of bumping up, you know, against the statutory debt limit, which is obviously, um, you know, front and center uh, for a lot of investors' attention. So, you know, when we get past June uh, D-Day in terms of the debt ceiling, QT is going to get its teeth back. And that's something that, in my opinion, I don't think was discussed enough and obviously won't be discussed in that form. But this is what we're here for. Yeah. Andres, I see you nodding your head. Yes. Well, I, I perfectly agree. Um, if we look at the upcoming liquidity outlook for May and June, um, it, it actually looks outright disastrous. Um, if you add a debt ceiling deal on top of QT, on top of liquidity withdrawals, now that the FDIC has started paying back emergency lending on behalf of some of the banks that have folded, uh, you probably get an, an aggregate removal of dollar liquidity to an extent of 500, maybe 600 billion in a matter of a quarter. Um, we can get to, to such levels. And uh, let me remind you that the exact peak in equity markets um, back in November 2021 and into year end coincided with that rebuilding of the Treasury General account after the debt ceiling deal was signed late 21 as well. So this is so. What's that mean for markets? What's going to what, it, and and then talk about that time frame. So is that the, the liquidity? Are you going to see it come back? Is that a short term situation, or is that could that last? I, I guess if if you listen to uh, some of the members of the committee uh, who actually care uh, care about this balance sheet issue, for example, Chris Waller. They expect to be able to bring liquidity levels down to roughly 10% of the size of the U.S. economy. That means 2.5, 2.6 trillion. They are roughly seven, 800 billion away from that target as of today, um, meaning that they have a lot of work to do to bring liquidity levels down to what they consider adequate levels. Uh, if they're able to bring them uh, to such levels, I, I guess we should expect some pain in equities. Um, mm. <laughs> Uh, on the way there. Uh, I'm not sure they're able to get all the way to what they consider to be equilibrium levels, but they will certainly give it a try. Uh, and that means you should uh, start to position in a defensive way, in my opinion. Uh, Mike, um, as we're, you know, mar U.S. markets closing here, and by the looks of it, the 10-year now, 3.358. Do you think, I think it was Andreas before was saying, listen, even if there are cuts, if the timing is off, there's going to have to be a repricing going on in markets. Do you see that happening? Yeah, well, that's sort of, you know, that goes into sort of the thesis that I have right now that I talked about a little bit before with respect to Europe and specifically the euro with positioning. So we, we, set, we see the positioning we see the sort of consensus thinking in terms of Europe being this winner from China reopening. And, you know, the ECB is going to continue to jack up rates after the Fed pauses, the Fed's going to pivot. Um, and so I think that's the major, major risk and why sort of a rally in the dollar could spell trouble for risk assets, you know, because you, you look at those different factors, right? You have sort of QT is going to be ongoing, whether or not the Fed pauses, QT is going to keep going. Then you have sort of this rebuilding of the Treasury general account. So that's a massive issuance of debt that's coming into the system, to suck liquidity out of the system. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, and then the last aspect is sort of if the Fed just pauses, right? And they don't immediately start going to cuts in, say, September, um, or if they don't get, I mean, I think we're looking at, 4.25, so almost, you know, 75, 100 basis points of cuts by December of this year. If we don't get that right away, like the market's expecting, then that is where you could really sort of see this really sharp unwind of this consensus narrative that the Fed's going to pivot, they're going to cut rates, the dollar's going to weaken, that's going to be a major tailwind for, for risk assets. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I see a lot of risk building in terms of the U.S. dollar and sort of an upside surprise, given that everyone is, seems to be so bearish on the dollar. Um, and then just to, to Andreas's point, I mean, I just think that the market recently has been trading recessionary. We're starting to see days where bond yields are falling and equities aren't ripping higher, right? I mean, that everyone got so in tune to sort of that relationship between tech and yields <laughs> last year. And that seems to be sort of reversing a little bit where, where yields are falling and equities are falling on bad data. 
you know, you see things like oil and gasoline and copper really starting to soften. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that I think there is a very strong risk that the Fed doesn't move as fast to sort of react to a potential recession, which is the way the market's trading. Mm. And that could cause a severe repricing in, in risk assets and, and in rates. Darius, we, we have jobs number coming out. How are you thinking about the U.S. economy here? Uh, no change to where we've been since last summer. Um, the U.S. economy has been in a very resilient state. Uh, there have been a variety of reasons, um, whether you look at the private sector balance sheet, you know, the composition of the economy, or you know, just kind of the general growth in private sector leverage or lack. In the data. Uh, We're lagging a little bit on Darius. You see in the data. And so, yeah. we, oh, you listen to me? Let, me, let me hop back on. I'll hop back on. I think he said he's going to hop back on. Uh, until, okay, he, I think he's going to exit and hop back on. Uh, are we. Um, Andreas, when I when I when we talk about the debt zone, we get a lot of questions about it from viewers. When we talk about it and we ask anyone who's a trader, especially, they're like, it's an odd event. They're going to it's going to be horrible. It's going to be ugly politics, a, you know, a, a dog and pony show. But at the end of the day, they'll do it. Um, and so they kind of treat it like that. Um, should we be more concerned? Is there more risk around that? Um, someone asking about the fact that Powell was like, hey, listen, that's not our problem to solve. Well, I, I mean, ultimately, they will sign a deal to, to lift the debt ceiling again. I, I simply um, lack. I was wondering if, if it's unintended consequences. Yeah. I think people yeah. are looking at some of the newer people in the caucus, kind of scorched earth policy, going to test, going to you know test the waters in a way they haven't. And is there an unintended mistake? I think that's what people worry about. Yeah, I, I, I mean. First, what will happen if we um, breach the crossover date, so the date where the U.S. Treasury no, is no longer able to fund the operations of the federal government, is that we will enter a partial shutdown. And we've been in that scenario for a couple of times, and typically that is a, a, a pretty decent uh, trigger event for politicians to actually sign a deal. Uh, should we get past that stage, then it is obviously full mayhem. Uh, I would consider such a scenario very, very, very unlikely, but it still matters a lot um, whether the U.S. Treasury will be allowed to refill its liquidity buffer at the Federal Reserve or not. And if they sign a solid debt ceiling deal, uh, lifting the debt ceiling by um, a, a load of, of billions, uh, the U.S. Treasury actually told us this week that they plan on refilling this war chest very fast after the um, debt ceiling deal is in place. Uh, and that is something that is of relevance to all of us because it means that we will see a lot of issuance of US treasuries. It means that the market will have to swallow all of these bonds again. Uh, it will have to swallow duration risk again, uh, meaning that um, markets will mechanically have to take less risk elsewhere. Um, and that typically makes equity markets suffer. Mm. Darius, uh, we heard Powell, as they always do, say we're data dependent. We're going to be watching the data, um, which, of course, leads everybody to say, OK, what data? What do you think is is key here for the Fed as they figure out whether they are going to pause or what would make them nervous? Is it still inflation? Is it employment? Is, is it really just what's happening in the banks and the reports they get from the loan supervisors as they come in through the regulatory side? What do you think is key? I don't think he's just thinking, folks. <laughs> I don't think my question was that hard. <laughs> I think he's, I think he's having some connectivity problems. Uh, Mike, why don't you take that one? Uh, what do you think is is going to be the determining fact? It has been pretty much inflation. What do you think it is now? I think it continues to be inflation unless we see a material deterioration in, say, the labor market or, you know. I mean, I, I would like to say more stress in the banking system, um, but I think they've kind of showed that, you know, with First Republic after SVB and Signature, I mean, if Andreas's prediction comes out that several more fell, you know, within the next couple of weeks, I mean, is that enough to get them to sort of start paying attention? I mean, 
I don't know. I mean, like I said, my feeling from today is it's kind of a head in the sand type of mentality. Mm. Um, And so I think at the end of the day, it still comes down to inflation unless we see a major sort of resurgence in in unemployment. Um, But yeah, I mean, for now, it's it's still the inflation game. Uh, Andreas, are the lags still in effect? I mean, how much is in the pipeline and how much has already hit the economy. And now you're going to have potentially credit contraction because of the banking situation on top of that. How much wouldn't we have seen it? Or is it just working through all of that mountain of stimulus that was put into the economy and that equilibrium still there? When does, when do we start to see the economy turn? I, I think we've added a new a new set of lags to the equation now, given that the liquidity crisis that we've seen through March and and into early April in the banking system is likely to spill over to a uh, conservative decision making among loan officers, right? Uh, and that's another lag to introduce to an, an already very complex set of lags from interest rate hikes last year. Um, and my base case is essentially that we will see the ramifications during the second half of the year, but not before. Um, since an interest rate hike typically takes between 14 and 18 months to filter through the system, while a liquidity crisis roughly takes two quarters to show its ugly face in credit. Uh, Mm -hmm. And we know that the Federal Reserve already knew the results of the loan officer survey out on Monday next week. And I actually noted a few interesting remarks from Powell in regards to that survey because he said that it was broadly in line with their expectations. And in the statement, they twisted the language around um, credit standards uh, so that they now write that it is likely that tr- credit tr- standards will tighten, meaning that the survey released on Monday will showcase tighter lending mm-hmm. standards. Uh, and if you look at lending standards versus actual bank lending, it typically takes roughly six months from tighter standards are um, being implemented at banks until you actually see the credit contraction. And on typical correlations, as of what we know today, we should expect a credit contraction uh, in between 5 and 10% of the total balance sheet side, size of the US banking system, which is quite a lot. Let me mm. remind you of that. Uh, it sounds like it's it's kind of peanuts given that we've had a credit expansion of, say, 20% or so of the balance sheet size. But uh, every single credit contraction in history has led to a recession. Um, it's very, very uh, clear that in this hyper-financialized system, uh, credit contraction will lead to lower economic activity. Uh, Andres, we have the ECB meeting this week as well, yeah. right? Don't we have that tomorrow? What, what yes. are you expecting there? Well, I think they will deliver a hike of 25 basis points, even though a hike of 50 basis points has been discussed. Um, But as Michael has also alluded to, I think they're pretty scared of the um, banking stress spilling over to Europe. Um, So in a sense, they've had a bit of time to prepare for this scenario, right? Uh, Given that it started uh, in the US and still mainly centers around the US um, financial system. Obviously, we've had the issue of Credit Suisse, but that's still outside of the Eurozone. Um, So I think they will play safe and and deliver a small hike, even though the inflation picture basically tells them to hike by 50 or 75 basis points. It's still very, very elevated relative to the inflation momentum in the US. Mike, if if the Europe overperforming has been played out or over exaggerated, or you think that's that's extreme, sounds like you're both saying that. And uh, the U.S. is facing these headwinds. What does outperform here? What looks good? Uh, I mean, it's tough. I mean, I you know when I think through sort of the setup for both risk assets as well as fixed income. I mean, I struggle to get a really clear picture because while on the one hand, you know, I I do think that the Fed is going to be forced to cut sooner than they want to. Now, I don't know if that comes in September or December. Um, The timing of that is really difficult. Now, yes, there's a nice yield aspect to that, that you can sort of get, you know, carry and, and sort of sitting in whether it's short duration fixed income. Um, but I think the timing of that is really difficult, um, especially because if they just sit and don't cut rates, I mean, there is a very real risk of a material repricing higher in yields that could deal you some pain. Um, 
you know, and, and risk assets the same. I mean, valuations are still extremely elevated. And so I struggle to see a lot of opportunity in those two asset classes. I personally have been spending a lot more time looking at things like, you know, we have a global liquidity dashboard that we're looking at that kind of just looks at policy rates versus uh, inflation rates and, and money supply and sort of the trend in policy rates and their, their last changes. And I just think we're setting up for some real serious divergence in monetary policy. You know, one of the things I wrote about this week was, you know, if you look at Brazil, I mean, yes, Lula has been making comments about how he feels that rates are too high. Um, you know, but if you look at sort of where their rates are, and I think it's like 13.75% versus inflation. Um, I mean, that's a massive, I mean, it's almost 10% real rate over inflation. Um, so whether it's, you know, playing sort of fixed income and in say like a, a Brazil or even the FX market, to me, I think that's where a lot of the opportunities and where we've been spending a lot of our time is much more on where sort of these divergent monetary policy decisions can come out and what that might mean for, you know, especially something like the euro where, you know, where positioning has been extremely lopsided um, and could spark a really nasty reversal if position starts to get unwind. Yeah. And George is saying, oh, don't leave out the BOJ as well. Darius, uh, we ha also, I mean, this is a busy week. We've also got Apple coming out after the bell. We saw some of the big, you know, a big uh, mega cap tech names. I saw a stat somewhere, and I don't have it in front of me, that I think it was $2.5 billion flowed into QQQ last week. Are, are, you know, what happens with all the money that's been chasing technology? How, how, how does that fit into the outlook based on what we just heard from the Fed? Yeah, so I mean, medium term, it's you know, I'd say medium term over the next, let's call it three to six months. I, you know, I don't know that it, anyone has a real foundational basis because, on one hand, a foundational basis to make a strong conviction call because, on one hand, you're going to likely see the economy, at least for mega cap tech, continue to be relatively resilient. You know, recessions don't really start for every consumer, every business at the same time. So those kinds of companies are going to likely continue to outperform from a from a fundamental standpoint. On the flip side. You know, we do have, you know, pretty severe inflection in global liquidity. Obviously, Andreas, uh, Michael and I were discussing earlier that, hey, you're going to have this pretty sizable inflection um, with respect to U.S. liquidity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the TGA and then these would be the TGA and quantitative tightening actually getting its teeth back. Uh, Brian, you could throw that slide four up there uh, where we show kind of the components of our uh, net, just net liquidity model, Fed balance sheet, emergency lending on the Fed's balance sheet, reverse repo, and the Treasury general account balance. I will caveat that by saying, we do have almost $250 billion in the TJA right now, and that thing's, that thing's got to go to zero before we start bouncing up. So I think over the very near term, it's going to be hard for asset markets to crack, particularly on that factor alone. But I think we're kind of missing the point right now. And I, I do want to kind of broaden out the discussion and talk about global liquidity, as Michael was trying to do here, because I think global liquidity has kind of become the dri in the driver's seat, particularly because we've seen such large deltas emanating from global central banks and global economies. So uh, Brian, if you can throw up chart one, or we show our global liquidity proxy there and how we get to our global liquidity proxy, what we're trying to do is amalgamate the sort of, you know, the influence upon liquidity. You know, again, it's a squishy concept, but the influence mm -hmm. upon liquidity from both the private sector and the public sector. And we do this by amalgamating global central bank balance sheets. We do this plus global narrow money supply plus um, world FX reserves. And that number is right around 94.4 trillion. It's up right around 2.3 trillion from where it bottomed in October. So that's positive. On the negative side, it's actually delta negative on a trend basis. So if you look at the trailing three months through April, that's that third panel in this chart here on chart one, uh, it's minus 6.5% on a three month annualized basis. And when you look at it, you start to deconstruct the components. This is where I'm actually getting more worried just in looking at the actual overall trend in the time series. And so when we look at slide two here, uh, we, we actually deconstruct the time series into the central bank balance sheet, into global narrow money supply, and into world FX reserves. And what we can see is, you know, we had a basically a plus $3.5 trillion impulse in global central bank balance sheet that's now minus, you know, $700 billion on a trillion to month basis. That impulse peaked in January. We had a plus $4.9 trillion impulse in global narrow money supply um, that peaked in, in January, and that's now almost minus $1 trillion on a trillion three month basis through April. And then with respect to world FX reserves, we had a trolling three month impulse of a right around, you know, kind of $850 billion that peaked uh, kind of in February. And that number's already uh, has declined all the way to just plus 60. So we got a pretty significant kind of removal in global liquidity. And I think that's kind of coming at the same time, you have this kind of, you know, 
we're running out of scope to have positive debt liquidity dynamics here in the U.S. as a vis-a-vis the debt ceiling and vis-a-vis toothless QT. So it could be pr- quite, quite a rocky summer. Mm. Uh, Andreas, I know that you have been looking at liquidity as well. You did your steno signals on that very issue. Uh, and if you don't have access to that, if you're not a member, you can scan the QR code so you can see that um, Andreas drops them every week. What are you looking at? Um, and do you also see this sort of lining up as problematic? Sounds like for the global economy. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with the assessment uh, of Darius. And I think the interesting thing here is that we have a divergence between the East and the West when it comes to liquidity trends. Uh, China uh, clearly added liquidity uh, into the first quarter. Bank of Japan added liquidity uh, to an extent that almost matched the pace of the Federal Reserve in March 2020, earlier this year. It was an extreme liquidity addition from Bank of Japan when they defended their yield curve control after lifting the cap by 25 basis points late last year. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that if you want to follow liquidity trends, it may be a good idea to add some equity exposure in Asia. Um, I'm not saying that you should act Uh, direct equity exposure to mainland China. I get the reasons why you don't want to do so, but maybe Japan is a decent option if you want some some equity exposure with less tricky liquidity developments. Mm. Uh, Andres, do you think that, I know we're going to start watching closely in June, do you think that BOJ is going to try to raise are they going to are they going to change their yield yield curve control levels? Are they going to try to raise that band again? I, I I mean they they actually did quite a few uh, changes to their communication uh, at the meeting last week uh, that, in my opinion, paved the way for a policy action in June. Um, but if they decide to increase the cap by twenty five basis points again, they will ultimately have to defend the new cap, I guess, as they did in January when they um, lifted the uh, yield curve control cap back in December. So what I'm saying here is that even in a scenario where they hike the yield curve control cap, they may have to um, to print more yens to defend it anyway. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Um, it, it, everyone pretty much assumes that the market's going to test their resolve if that happens. Mm-hmm. We're we're almost out of time, but Mike, if you're looking, if you think the dollar trade, it sounds like that's the one you're the most interested in. Um, are you waiting and watching for something? Are you starting to do anything now? How are you thinking about expressing that? So, I mean, it's a little bit of sort of dipping my toe in on a couple of different trades. Um, you know, I'm, I, you know, I have a sort of toolbox, if you will, of different technical signals that I use to sort of help me with my trades. You know, I have my sort of broader thesis, um, and I sort of wait for my signals to start to fire. So, you know, yes, I did step into the euro today on the short side, just a little bit, um, you know, sort of in that post release statement um, where the euro kind of shot up to the upside and it gave up a decent amount of that in the afternoon. Um, at the same time, I don't want to add a ton of risk in case we get any sudden surprises from the ECB tomorrow. So, um, you know, for me, uh, it's sort of dipping my toe in um, because I do think that. You know what technicals aside you know whether it's the fed pivoting to rate cuts um or it's you know everyone believes that once the debt ceiling impasse is resolved that's naturally going to be a dollar net negative because of sort of the upheaval and um and you know whatnot people are going to be upset with the us and lose faith in the us because of everything that's going on that's just become such an overwhelming narrative Um, while there's very real fundamental liquidity things going on that, um, you know, yeah, I'm comfortable stepping in from more of a fundamental and catalyst type um, situation. And then I'll wait for the technicals to start to turn more to to add to those. Which makes sense in this environment. Uh, Darius, I'm going to give you the last word, but I got to tell you, as usual, we're getting a lot of love for your shirts and Johnny Airport believes you should come out with a line of your own. So uh, just a little (laughs) entrepreneurial idea for you (laughs) as we navigate these this tough macro environment, but what what do you want to leave people with? What what what's going to be on your radar? What are you looking at, and where do you, um, where's the risk that you want to keep an eye on? Yeah, so I'll end with three things. Uh, number one, don't thank me, thank Tommy Bahama. Um, number two, <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two, uh, just remember that the Fed is a reactive government agency. 
uh, and they're not going to spray, you know, the liquidity hose, get in the fire truck and spray that liquidity hose without, you know, a burning house to put out. And we have to ultimately have to get into that burning house process, which in our opinion, it's not been priced in the equity and credit markets. And quite frankly, it hasn't really been priced in the fixed income markets as well. If you look at the amount of rate cuts or the lack thereof uh, that are actually priced in from a terminal uh, Fed funds rate floor perspective. And then lastly, uh, zooming back out to this concept of global liquidity, um, it's definitely no longer improving. Um, it, it's not sort of contracting the way it was throughout 2022, but you can make the case that it might actually start to contract uh, the way it was throughout 2022. And I'll just leave you with two final thoughts on that, which is, the Chinese economy is the, 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 you know, part of the reason we saw such a significant uptick in global liquidity last year is we saw the Chinese economy kind of really struggling uh, late in the year. Um, and the PBOC was very keen to give the Chinese economy a, a kind of a fundamental boost in the absence of meaningful fiscal stimulus. Well, China's economy is now standing on its own two feet. We can clearly see that in the data of you know, GDP and Q1 is 4.5%. It's well on its way to meeting that government target of 5% for 2023. So it's very unlikely that PBOC is you know, in the game. We're going to have skin in the game the same degree. And then I have a variant perception with uh, Andreas um, with respect to the BLJ um, for two reasons. One, you know, part of what we saw, the, part of what we saw investors in terms of attacking BLJ's yield curve control framework and kind of forcing that speculation upon uh, the policy there is part of the reason for that was we saw you know, global bond market volatility as high as it had you know, pretty much ever been at least in recorded history on that time period. And now that bond market volatility is much lower, it's very unlikely we see, you know, kind of the attacks uh, we see on the BLJ policy. But uh, secondarily, um, UAD has been pretty clear that he's not necessarily in favor of piecemeal uh, changes to the policy. Um, you know, so that might, that may kind of delay any big changes in policy, you know, kind of until next year. So in our view, this concept of global liquidity at the bare minimum is no longer improving, and it's probably going to get a lot worse vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. economy and U.S. liquidity dynamics over the next, let's call it, six months. Fantastic. Darius, Mike, Andreas, so appreciate all of you coming on and helping us not only break down what happened, but really uh, give us a lot of information and, and things that we really need to keep our eye on as we move forward. So appreciate all of you. Appreciate Thanks, you, Maggie. Thanks, We're going to be back on with jo uh, George Gonzalez. George is on with us tomorrow. George Gonzalez is on with us tomorrow and we'll talk about ECB and look ahead to Fed. So we'll see you all then. In the meantime, take care and good luck out there.